Ok. Ok, listo. All listo. right. <clears throat> so, thank you for the introduction, Arbita. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about our project in Sequis, which I've titled Helicoverpa Moths in Puerto Rico, a test for hybridization. Uh, this is just one of the projects that we work on in Sequis, um, which at the moment is myself and Dr. Steve Massey, uh, where we work with Helicoverpa armigera and Helicoverpa zia hybridization and developing a identification test uh, to separate hybrid, hybridized moths from the adult species. Oops. Let's see, ah, there we go. All right, so for an outline for today's presentation, uh, like I said, our primary focus for this project is studying the hybridization of Helicoverpa zia and Helicoverpa armigera moths here in, here in Puerto Rico, where our main goal is to, is to develop a method to differentiate differentiate hybridized Zia armigera from the parent Zia or the parent armigera species. Uh, at the moment, there is no way to do this beyond a uh, whole genome sequencing analysis. Um, so our goal is to develop a means for different research groups around the world to test samples that they may collect out in the field for hybridization uh, between these two species. And our secondary objectives in uh, our Helicoverpa project in Sequis is to monitor population levels of Helicoverpa in our sentinel block that we maintain in Juana Diaz, in La Estación Agricola in Juana Diaz, where we sample monthly uh, and count and preserve samples of Helicoverpa from our sentinel plot every month throughout the year. And we also maintain a small live colony of Helicoverpa uh, for the purpose of collaborations to share with other labs here or other labs in the states or other countries um, and as a way to pr promote and foster um, collaborations and relationships with other labs. Okay, so first to introduce our primary species of interest, Helicoverpa zia, which in English, the common name is the corn earworm, the tomato fruit worm, or simply the bowl worm. Um, here in Puerto Rico, I've heard it commonly called just a gusano, um, however, throughout the presentation, I'm going to say Zia or Helicoverpa Zia, just to be specific. Um, this species is native to the Americas, being North, South, and Central America and the Caribbean. It is a very common pest of corn, soybeans, tomatoes, peppers, and cotton, where it can, it has been noted to host on around 100 different species of plants. Uh, here in Puerto Rico, I have encountered Zia for the most part on corn, tomatoes, and peppers. Um, back in North Carolina, where I studied for my PhD, uh, for the most part, I would find them on cotton. So Helicoverpa zia, unfortunately, has a very widespread levels of insecticide resistance. Um, these being both chemical sprayable insecticides, such as organophosphates or carbamates, um, and also GMO insecticides, these being BT crops. Uh, for example, Bt corn or Bt cotton, uh, Zia unfortunately is res resistant to both of these means of control. Uh, it's estimated that every year, uh, Helicoverpa Zia as a species is responsible for around $1 billion in damage to agricultural products. So improving methods of control and reducing damage by these insects to agricultural products is of great interest to everybody in the US and um, around the world as well. So our second species, Helicoverpa armigera, um, which has the common name I've heard the cotton bullworm, so it, in English, uh, which is very close to Zia's common name. Um, so in interest of specificity, I will call this one armigera or Helicoverpa armigera for our presentation. This species is native to Europe, Africa, and Asia. Um, unfortunately, it invaded into Brazil in 2013 and then was detected here in Puerto Rico in 2014. Um, overall, it is more damaging to plants than Zia, um, both in that it hosts on a greater number of host plants. For example, around 172 different host plants have been uh, documented to be eaten by Armigera. And also Armigera just in general eats more plant material in comparison to Zia before it will 
uh, move into the next life stage being a pupa. Um, so there's a lot of concern about our misera spreading beyond Brazil and beyond Puerto Rico and becoming established in the rest, the other regions of the Americas. Um, also another me reason that this is a, a concern is that compared to Zia, our misera has different levels of insecticide susceptibility depending on what class of insecticide you're looking at. So for example, Zia, in a local area, Azia might not be resistant to carbamic insecticides. However, our measure would be. So like I said, our measure was first detected in Brazil in 2013, um, where in Brazil, our measure has now become a well-established pest of soybeans and other crops. Um, at this time, no one really knows where it came from, uh, from the old world being Africa, Asia, or Europe. Uh, at this time, it's unknown. However, in the future, we may be able to figure that out by using uh, genomic analysis. So like I said, our measure causes more damage annually. Um, it's estimated that, that our measure as a species is responsible for about $2 billion annually to agricultural products. Um, so there's a lot of effort in order to first uh, monitor whether the species is spreading through the, uh, through the Americas, and then secondly, take steps in order to um, reduce any potential harm to agriculture that it may um, end up causing. And this map here at the bottom is a projection uh, that was originally created uh, here in Sequis uh, when our major was detected in Puerto Rico about the potential spread. Um, at this time, I have been screening for our measure in our Sentinel block in Juanadias, uh, but have not found any our measure in Juanadias in 2022 or 2023. Whether that means that they have hybridized or they are no longer present in Juanadias, I don't know. But we'll get more into that later. So, unfortunately, these two species have the capacity to hybridize. Um, this is likely due that Helicoverpazia diverged evolutionarily from our measure an estimated 1.5 million years ago. Um, the hybrid offspring are, are cryptic, meaning that they are difficult to differentiate. Um, this picture here, you can see that the pure species alone look very, very similar and are by sight alone. It's quite difficult to tell them apart, especially if you're looking at uh, an infested plant. Um, with larvae, they look very similar and you might not know what species you're dealing with and therefore you won't know what might be the best pesticide or control method to apply if you can't identify the species. Um, beyond being difficult to identify, the main concern of hybridization is that the hybrid offspring might inherit um, negative traits from the parent species, being insecticide resistance or feeding behavior um, one concern might be that a hybridized, if hybrids become established uh, here in the Caribbean or in the rest of the Americas, the hybrid offspring may inherit the feeding behavior, um, the amount of plant material or the resistance traits that are uh, found in our measure and are currently not very widespread in this part of the world. Uh, they may become widespread if hybridization uh, occurs en masse. So I, we've broken down our approach to the problem of hybridization into four main steps. So first, what we needed to do is to create and gather a diverse library of Zia, Armisura, and Zia Armisura hybrids uh, samples here in Sequis, uh, which we did as a previous member of our lab had started this process, and I have continued to do this um, since arriving here two years ago. Uh, secondly, what we needed to do is we needed to improve and add whole genome sequencing data for these species. Um, at the moment, our measure is well studied. There's a lot of publicly available genetic data for our measure from uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. However, for Zia, the diversity of data is much, much lower. So for example, um, at the moment, there is only sequencing data for Zia from Brazil and from the Eastern United States. So one of our side objectives was simply to increase the quantity and quality of sequencing genomic data available for, to the public for Zia, which we have already started by adding 
multiple new states um, here, Puerto Rico, uh, and new countries in Central and South America as well. So thirdly, what we wanted to do was we wanted to use single nucleotide polymorphisms, which I'll come back to in a minute, uh, to de develop a method of identification for hybrids in the lab. Um, and then fourthly, the last thing we need to do is validate that this hybrid test we design in step three works with hybrid samples we have collected here in the lab. And then to screen helicoverpa samples that we have collected from across the US and from different countries in the Americas as well for evidence of hybridization. So uh, a few years back, back in 2017, a previous member of the lab, Dario Trujillo, um, as part of his thesis, conducted breeding experiments with Armigera and Zia to see if creating hybrids in the lab was viable um, for experimentation purposes. So what he did was he used Armigera males collected from Brazil uh, and Zia females collected from Puerto Rico in Isabela at La Estación Agricola. Um, and then he bred hybrids to the F1 and the F2 generations and then preserved them in our minus 20 freezer here in Secchi's for future experiments, uh, which is where I picked up with uh, two years ago. So he found that breeding the hybrids in the lab was actually quite difficult. Um, when crossing the two species with an Armigera male and Armigera father and a Zia mother, um, the offspring, only 11% of the eggs that they produced by this cross were viable and would hatch and become larva. Um, he found that when you reverse the cross to a female Armigera and a male Zia, the eggs were even less viable. We have no way to tell if in the field, the level of egg viability is any different. Um, I don't know if anyone would ever be able to figure that out, but we found in the lab setting uh, that the viability was quite low. So the first thing he tried was to see if traditional methods of species differentiation would work for separating hybrids from parent Zia or parent Armigera. So traditionally, you can use two uh, different methods to identify a Zia or identify an Armigera. The first being using internal reproductive organ morphology. So here in panel A, um, we have the internal reproductive organ of an armigera, a helicoverpa armigera. So you can see that this organ has one lobe. Here in panel B, we have the same organ in a zia, where you can see that zia had three lobes. So when dissecting one of the F1 hybrids produced here in Secchi's, you can see that each of these four panels here are different individual hybrids. The hybridized individuals also have three lobes. So using internal morphology would not work to, uh, to separate a hybrid helicoverpa from an armigera or a zia. You would, they would all look like zia. Um, secondly, you can use species-specific PCR uh, to, identif to uh, identify a zia or identify an armigera, which is what I use here uh, for our, our um, collected samples as I validate the species with ITS1 PCR, which is a generic PCR method developed by another research group in 2015, I believe, um, where uh, using a generic PCR test, you can validate whether a sample is Zia or a sample is R Majora. Um, unfortunately, this also does not work for hybrids. So we had to come up with another means to differentiate hybridized helicoverpa from Zia or R Majora parents. So the first it, the first step was to come up with the, a conceptual pipeline of uh, differenti differentiating hybridized helicoverpa from parent Zia or parent Armigera. And we did this with a process called add mixture analysis. And this part was done by Dr. Steve Massey, uh, uh, one of our PIs for the lab. Um, so this initial, um, I don't know if I would call it maybe, a, I don't know if I would call it a pilot study phase, but a preliminary phase to this project was to first sequence eight different samples of helicoverpa, two of which were the F1 hybrids that Dario bred here in Secchi's, five helicoverpa zia um, from different states in the US and here in Puerto Rico, 
and then one Pelagoverpa armigera from Brazil, um, which is the invasive genotype, meaning that it was, it's an armigera from Brazil where that it is an invasive species, not from Europe, Asia, or Africa where it is native. So then using the sequencing data that we produced, we used single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, which are single base pair substitutions, meaning that uh, in a, uh, a genetic sequencing, uh, in, a, in a genetic sequence, what is normally an A or a C or a T will change um, without causing harm to the individual. However, these SNPs or these single nucleotide polymorphisms can be informative of different conditions of interest. In our case, we wanted to see if they could be used to identify hybrids, but they can also be applied to be identify a breed of plant or breed of animal, for example, cattle or sheep um, or diseases of interest as well. So over here in our chart, um, each of these different codes is a unique SNP that was that we identified from our eight samples that we sequenced. Um, all of these in red are those that are only found in Armigera, and these in blues are those that are only found in Zio. So using this admixture analysis, uh, we were able to accurately predict species and level of hybridization by using uh, these SNPs that were identified from these eight samples. So a Zia sample was accurately predicted to be a Zia at 100%. Uh, our Armigera sample was predicted to be 100% Armigera. And one of the F1 hybrids um, was predicted to be 55% Armigera and 45% Zia based on what which of these SNPs here on this chart were identified in the sequencing data for each of these samples. Um, so the next, now that we see that SNPs can be used to identify hybrids and differentiate a hybrid from a parent species, we need to improve the precision and accuracy of this potential test by increasing sampling diversity and sequencing diversity um, for our, our species um, so that the set of SNPs we use as a target to identify hybrids is more representative of the whole world rather than just these initial eight samples. Okay, so this is where I picked up with the project um, two years ago. So we started with uh, increasing sequencing diversity and sampling diversity, like I said. Um, so our first set of ex DNA extractions and sequencing experiments, uh, I conducted over a hundred different extractions of Zia, Armigera, and hybrid samples that were stored here in Sekis. Um, from that set of samples, uh, we selected 31 of the highest quality um, samples um, from a diverse set of states and regions in the US to add to our sequencing diversity data set. The criteria I used to select what samples we wanted to use for sequencing was based on gel electrophoresis and a nano drop uh, analysis. So here in this gel picture, what we looked for for high quality samples was to look for high molecular weight genomic DNA. So on a gel, if you want to look for high genomic weight DNA, which means it is ideal for DNA sequencing, you will see that since it's high molecular weight, it's heavy, it's not gonna move very far in your gel. So you'll see dark streaks at the top of your gel. The second metric we used to select samples for sequencing was with a nano drop, where we looked at concentration of DNA in one small drop of DNA extract and also the absorbance values where the ideal ratio is between 1.8 and 2.0 absorbance uh, value, um, which we use to select samples for sequencing. So from the 31 samples, we, se we sequenced 31 samples, one of which was a failure. Uh, I believe that was because uh, some sort of error with the sequencing machine happens. The, the company didn't really explain to us why it failed. But anyway, we got 30 new genomes produced, which is we did this in 22. So the we got results from this batch of sequencing in October of 2022, um, where we added four new Zia samples, which were all the mothers of our F1 and F or F1 hybrids produced here in Sekis. 
for our measure of fathers, which are all the fathers of the F1 hybrids here in Techies, for F1 Zia, Zia our major hybrids, and then 19 Zia from different states in the US. For this batch of sequencing, we focused on the Eastern US. So like I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, before we started this project, the publicly available genomic data for Zia was very limited. Um, before this project went on, there was only there were only samples available from Washington, D.C., uh, Texas, and Arkansas. Arkansas. Um, so we started with the eastern U.S. and central U.S., where we produced new Zia genomes from Colorado, Kentucky, Illinois, Louisiana, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Florida, West Virginia, Virginia, uh, Rhode Island, and Maine. We did e this year in 2023, we did even more sequencing and sampling in order to increase our sampling diversity even further um, as uh, eventually we have to set a limit on how many samples we can collect. But for a while, the most, every sample we could lay our hands on, we tried to do. So this year we were able to collect new samples from Paraguay uh, and Costa Rica where I formed new collaborations between um, institutions in Costa Rica and in Puerto and Paraguay um, to help us collect samples of Zia from their countries to send to us to sequence and make public and help develop a, a method of uh, detecting hybridization of helicoverpa. We also got new samples from Arizona, California, Oregon, uh, Kansas, Iowa, and New York. So this New York sample is particularly interesting um, by looking at a, so in regards to Helicoverpa um, hybridization, there are a couple other groups around the world that work on in this area. Um, one group in Australia uh, studied this concept back in 2018, where they worked with a sample of Helicoverpa Zia from New York, which was sampled in 2005. Um, by look, using the admixture pipeline on this sample, which is publicly available, we detected uh, evidence for Armisura in a Zia from 2005, which suggests that Armisura may or may not have um, made its way to the new world prior to that original date of 2013, um, uh, which is what we originally thought. Um, so anyway, this is from a sample from 2005. So we need to see if in 2023, there's still evidence for Armidura in New York um, or other parts of the states uh, in Zia samples. So we contacted the group that collected the sample from 2005, and we were able to obtain 2023 New York Helicoverpa Zia, and we'll be testing them for hybridization further along. Okay, for this actual sequencing, um, it was just luminous sequencing where we did this with Rapid Genomics, a company in Florida, which does whole, ge whole genome sequencing on the Illumina platform. When we got our sequencing results, we underwent some quality control metrics to, to help sort our results to make sure they were okay before proceeding with SNP analysis and creating a, um, a method of hybrid identification. So we did this first by looking at quality score read length and Q value, or FRED score for our FASTQ files. Um, a second metric of quality control that we went through for our 30 genomes that we sequenced uh, was what's called MitoScan. So MitoScan is a protocol developed by Dr. Massey uh, originally for COVID, um, where you can look through a genomic DNA sample that has been sequenced and by picking out all of the mitochondrial genomes that can be detected in that sample, you can tell, um, you can get a good idea about what kind of sequencing quality you got and whether or not there may or may not be any contamination in your sample. So when you're looking at SNP analysis, so the first step is, is in identifying SNPs, you want to make sure you have a high count of reads for your species of interest and you want to minimize the amount of off-target species in your sample, as that can interfere with the process of uh, calling SNPs from, uh, for your target species. 
Um, so MitoScan is a way to select the best samples um, that you want in order for the SNP calling process. So the way we did the MitoScan is what I did is using our FASTQ files, which were the result of sequencing, I mapped these to the mitochondrial reference genomes for every species that is publicly available, um, which I, is pulled off of GeneBank. Um, and then it, you essentially create a list and a, with a read count and a coverage for each species of mitochondria, uh, the, for the mitochondria of each species found in your sample that you sequenced. So this here is a section of the MitoScan results from our Puerto Rico, Heluca Repazia. So this one was very good. You can see that our top result of with 100% coverage and 358,000 different reads was all Heluca Repazia. You can see some are measure in there. Since they are very closely related, it's likely not contaminated with our measure, but the, the, the um, mapping alignment software um, identifies them our measures as our measures since they're very closely related species. Now, if we saw a very, very high read count for our measure, we might think that might be some contamination. Okay. So the next step we needed to do is to identify more SNPs which were suitable for hybrid identification. So I, this figure over here is kind of to help visualize what a base pair substitution might look like. So for in a normal sequence where you might have an A, um, a SNP would be at that A position, you would find a C, a G, or a T. Um, or what if what is normally a C, you will find an A, or G, or a T. So these SNPs are usually harmless. Um, they won't kill the individual. Um, however, they can be used to identify um, uh, different conditions of interest, such as hybridization, um, a breed of plant or animal, uh, or a disease, or cryptic species. Um, so the way we did this is we took our sequencing FASTQ files and mapped them to the Helicover our measure reference genome. Then using a tool called BCF Tools, which is a bioinformatics uh, program, which will call all of the SNPs where individual bases in our sample are different from the reference genome. Uh, using this, the BCF tools, we found around 100,000 genome-wide SNPs um, that we thought, we think, are, are pertinent to identifying heliprope hybrids and differentiating them from parent armigera or parent zia. However, 100,000 is a little too much, so we had to narrow down that list a little bit. Um, in order to have a more manageable number of target SNPs in order to identify hybrids. So we refined this list to 1,000 SNPs um, using a criteria of SNPs that had high fidelity, meaning they were very common. They were found all across the whole genome and not, for example, not isolated to sex chromosomes. So if we had designed sex, uh, SNPs specific to sex chromosomes, then a hybrid ID test would only work for whichever sex the be it male or, male or female um, that the SNP was originally identified in. We also tried to use SNPs that had high read depth, meaning they were found in many, many of the reads, uh, the sequencing reads. Uh, they had a low minor allele frequency and a high quality score. And using these criteria, we were able to narrow our list down to 1000. So to construct a hybrid identification test, we decided to create what is called a SNPs-based genotyping test to identify hybridized helicobrepa in the lab. So SMP genotyping or SNP genotyping is a molecular biology method that uses SNPs specific to a condition of interest being plant, being that, that being plant breed, a disease or a hybrid uh, to identify the condition in a sample where you don't know what it is, you don't know if it has a specific disease or what breed of cattle, for example, it is. So in SNP genotyping, there are three major categories of method that you can use. The first being PCR-based, the second being microarray-based, and the third being sequencing, targeted sequencing-based. Um, in order to help us select the best methods that 
uh, was suitable for the equipment and the finding that we have here in Secchi's, I conducted a literature review of genotyping technologies that are still common in 2022 and 2023 uh, to help us select the best method, uh, which we published back in August um, in Applied Biosciences, if anyone is interested in that. Um, we landed on using a targeted sequencing approach. So the way a targeted sequencing approach, which is also can also be called Amplicon sequencing or AmpliSeq, is you design a pool of PCR primers of up to 20,000 different PCR primer pairs that are each individual primer pair is going to be specific to one of the SNPs that you think is pertinent to your condition that you want to identify in your sample. Then you conduct multiplex PCR with a DNA sample from your unknown sample and your pool of primers, which will produce a pool of amplicons, which is the product of PCR. Then with your pool of amplicons, you sequence that. And by looking at the sequencing files, you can see which of your amplicons are present in the result of your multiplex PCR. By picking through that data, you can find which SNPs were amplified and which therefore, or which PCR primers were amplified and therefore which SNPs are present in your unknown DNA sample. So we picked this method um, due to, for a multitude of different reasons. The first being accuracy. Uh, this method is accurate in compare is much more accurate in comparison to the PCR or the microarray based methods. Uh, secondly, it also allows for targeting more uh, SNPs. So with the PCR-based methods, you can only target a handful of SNPs for a genotyping test, um, and microwaves are much are far too expensive. So we chose this for accuracy, the number of SNPs we can target, um, and it also allows a high degree of customizability. Um, so since no one else besides us has ever tried to genotype helicoverpa using SNPs. Um, so at this time, no one knows which SNPs are more important detecting hybrids in comparison to others. So for those reasons, that's why we had to start with a large number of SNPs being a thousand. Um, so that's why we chose AmpliSeq and targeted sequencing for our method. So we designed a custom multiplex AmpliCon sequencing genotyping kit, uh, which I'm happy to announce arrived here in Secchi's on Thursday. Um, so once the new year starts, we'll get start working with that to validate that this works and that we can identify hybrids in the lab. Uh, we did this with a company called Paragon Genomics, which specializes in uh, designing genotyping kits for various diseases, cancers, um, COVID, and they also do custom uh, species. So if you have your own project looking at genotyping with um, a different condition of interest, be that breed or disease, uh, they do custom species as well. So by working with the company, we even further, we further narrowed down our list of 1,000 SNPs to 756 different SNPs, um, which we believe are going to be able to differentiate a hybrid Helicoverpa from a Zia or an Armijra. Um, so in our kit, there are 756 different PCR primer pairs uh, that we will, we will run multiplex PCR with um, on a DNA sample of F1 hybrids. Um, and then by sequencing that result, we will, we will be able to tell whether this kit works. So after the initial validation, which we will do with Illumina sequencing, um, we would like to further refine our protocol by using a benchtop minion sequencer. Um, Illumina sequencing can take months depending on uh, a company, depending on where you're located, whether you need to ship uh, DNA, and also in, in the shipping process that can introduce things like whether it, your ice melts and your DNA gets contaminated or all sorts of problems like this. So we would like to make, uh, we would like to improve our pipeline by introducing a Minion sequencer where we, we conduct this whole process of species identification and hybrid identification here in Psyche's without having to ship things or get permits um, or wait for months at a time. Um, the next thing we would like to do is after validating that our test works is we also need to screen for evidence of hybridization 
from all those samples that we collected from the different states in the US, um, here in Puerto Rico that we have collected temp uh, over time, and from the different countries in the Americas where we have also received samples of Helicarpa. We need to test for evidence of hybridization. Okay, so another thing we did uh, through this fall was, like I mentioned previously, uh, genomic data for Zia is rather lacking in comparison to our measure. So an, as a side effort, we have produced a new mitochondrial genome, reference genome for Zia from our Puerto Rico Helicoverpa Zia, which we sampled from Isabella. Uh, and we have published that on GenBank, which here's the accession number. Um, using beyond just the purpose of increasing publicly available diversity, we also wanted to conduct a mitochondrial genome phylogeny uh, in order to help us predict uh, and give us clues about where, firstly, where Zia came from originally, um, since it did not originate here in the Caribbean, it likely came from um, other parts of the continent um, all those millions of years ago. Um, we think that by conducting a phylogeny with Zia, we might be able to get clues about where our measure originally came from to the new world and therefore, and also get clues about where hybrids may or may not, how hybrids may or may not spread throughout the new world as well. So I've also created new mitochondrial genomes for Helicoverpa Zia from Brazil, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Maine, North Carolina, Tennessee, Illinois, Louisiana, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Rhode Island, South Carolina, and West Virginia. So this set is everything available. I, I picked through everything available on GenBank and everything we have done here in Secchi's. And this collection here is every piece of genomic data that is publicly available for Zia at this time. Um, so what we're gonna do is make a, what we did is we made a phylogenetic tree from these mitochondrial genomes to try to trace the lineage of Zia here in the new world. Um, so at, once we finish sequencing, the key members to add are our samples from Costa Rica and Paraguay once we have finished sequencing with them, uh, which we're waiting on some permits from the USDA to ship our DNA from here to Florida for this, to the sequencing lab. Um, so as you can see here, all of these are from Brazil, Puerto Rico, or the US states. So these from Central America and other parts of South America will be very, very interesting to add into our phylogeny. So the tree we made, um, I created using a program called PhiML, which is was originally a command line based phylogenetic software. Um, however, they did release a web version, which was very user friendly, if anyone else is interested in constructing phylogenies. Um, so most of our tree makes sense and is of has high bootstrap values. You can see above 85 uh, or close to 85. Uh, for the most part, they make sense being that our mitochondrial genomes for the different states appear to be closely related. Um, and we see down here that our Puerto Rico Zia is most closely related to one of the Brazilian Zias that we included. However, interestingly enough, our second Brazilian Zia is more closely related to Minnesota than the other Brazil or the Puerto Rico samples, which threw up some red flags. Um, we believe this is due to differences in sequencing quality. So this second Brazil two sample here had a much lower read uh, number of read count in comparison to this Brazil one being 6,000 reads first versus uh, 177,000 reads for the mitochondrial genome. Um, so this is likely due to sequencing depth, but like I said, since these outside of the US and Puerto Rico, these two Brazil samples are the only available samples. So we wanted to include them um, to see what it would look like in a phylogeny. Um, and we do still think that this is giving a clue about where, how Zia spread through the new world um, and also how our measure may have also spread. Um, from South America to the Caribbean. Oops. Okay, so a, another side effort we conduct in Sequis is population monitoring of noctuids in a sentinel plot that we maintain in La Estación Agricola in Juan Adias, where we regularly plant 
corn and soybeans. Um, the purpose of this area is first to have an easy way to sample for noctuids, um, if we need them for uh, experiments in the lab or to share with collaborators. There we monitor regularly for three different species, being Spodoptera frugiperta, Helicorpazia, and Chrysodaxis includens, or, or soybean loopers. Um, we have over three years of adult moths collected from our plant scent area that are preserved in the lab here in the freezer. Um, what we would like to do with our preserved Zia is to temporarily use our hybrid test to see whether or not any hybrids have shown up in Juanadias over the last three years. Uh, since at this time, there's no way to tell. Uh, with our hybrid test, hopefully we will, we will be able to give a definitive answer whether hybridization um, has occurred at all over the last three years um, in Juanadias. So the other purpose is to share samples with other Lepidoptera labs. Um, we have collaborators in the USDA lab in Colorado, which regularly looks at Spodoptera diversity. So we've been sharing with them as well. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we'll be using our hybridization test on uh, the Zia sentinel block samples. Our graph here shows how the Zia populations spike in our sentinel area. So for the most part, they in it's similar to the other parts of the world where there is a winter period. They never go away completely, but the populations do increase significantly in the late spring and throughout the summer, uh, and then plummet a bit in the winter months. The last thing is we maintain collections of live Zia for collaboration purposes and pilot projects if needed, um, where we have live Helicarpa that we, in the past, collected from Isabella off of corn, Juana Diaz off of corn, Santa Isabel off of tomatoes and peppers, and Inguanica off of tomato. With that, I would like to acknowledge all the past and present members of SECIS that have contributed to this long, ongoing project, being Paulo Augusto, Diane Hidalgo Nora, Dario Trujillo, Jose Carlos Verley Rodriguez, Stephen Massey, and Consuelo Estevez, and also our invaluable UPR Rio Piedras volunteer undergraduates, which help us very much in the labs and they um, are, uh, contribute a lot to our lab work. Each of the permits that we use um, when working with the invasive species, being the Armigera, these are the permits that that work was conducted under. Um, and our funding is also through USDA APHIS and under this grant number. So with that, uh, are there any questions?